So, open your Bibles. We're in a study in 1 Corinthians. Uh, while I was on sabbatical, the guys, chapter 7, uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, while on sabbatical, the guys shared uh, one chapter a week. And with all the, with our snow breaks or cancellations and uh, some different things that we did, it was six chapters that were handled over 14 weeks, a chapter a night over 14 weeks. And so last week I tried to do um, the best I could, an overview of those six chapters. Um, but <laughs> silly me, I just, I get myself caught in the weeds. But anyhow, uh, we, I did the best I could to get us up to chapter six so that we can begin in chapter seven. Paul says this, now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Amen. So let's pray. And, um, <laughs> I know that these guys were really hoping they wouldn't have to teach chapter 7. So they got their wish. Herman and Sally had been married for like 50 years, and uh, they were having b b this surprise anniversary party was thrown for them, and uh, Herman stood up, and, and he, he looked at Sally and, he, Sally, and he said, Sally, after all these years, you are tried and true. And Sally, after all those years, was a little hard of hearing, and she said, what? I said, Sally, after all these years, you're tried and true. What did you say? I said... After all these years, you're tried and true. He said, you know, after all these years, I'm pretty tired of you, too. <laughs> so, and, you know, we joke about marriage. Uh, and, and, you know, for, for some of us, if we have, you know, a healthy marriage, it's, it's, it can be fun. If, um, if it's not the healthiest marriage, sometimes those jokes uh, can still be made, but uh, they might hurt more. Uh, when we get to the punchline, but um, there's there there is a lot of joke. We 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 need to lighten up sometimes and see the humor in our relationships with one another. There's you know there's a lot to laugh at. I know Renee's laughing all the time at me. Um, I have nothing to laugh about, but I mean, to, 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 right, huh? Um, so so, but you know it's it's great to have a healthy relationship. And Paul, what he's doing here, and I think it's important that we remember, he's responding to, to correspondence that he's received. And, and specifically now, he says, concerning the things about which you, you wrote to me. Now he, he addresses this. They, they had written to him about a number of things, um, marriage, celibacy, Divorce, those were some of the things that they had asked about. Um, meat offered to idols doesn't seem to be a concern for us in our day and age, but I think if, if you extrapolate that out or, or maybe, um, it's probably a better word for it than extrapolate, but if you abstract that, maybe that's a better word, if you abstract that concept out a little bit, we can find out how much it really does apply to us. And, um, that's chapter 8. We're, not, we're certainly not getting there tonight. Um, spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? What are we to do with spiritual gifts? How do we responsibly handle uh, the gifts of the Spirit that God has, um, has entrusted us with? And he has, every single one of us, he has entrusted us. We are stewards of the gifts of the Spirit um, that, that he's given to us. To each one of us, it's been given certain gifts in different measures, and there are expectations for every single one of our lives. Um, in terms of how we employ them, and we'll talk more about that when we get to, to chapter 12. Um, giving was one of the topics that, that they had asked about, the resurrection. Uh, they had a lot of fears about that because of some of the ways that they had been misled by some of the false teachers. So there were a number of things, and, um, as, and, and, and including the divisions that were in the church. We looked at that last week, and, and the guys had handled that talking about, you know, especially in chapter 1, the divisions between believers, some saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter. Um, there was division in the church, and it's contrary to the heart of God that there would be division. There should always be unity in the church of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean uniformity, and that's one of the things that very often in churches, and I, you know, I don't want to press us too hard, but I know that the, um, 
the church that Renee and I came out of uh, before, before this church got planted back in 99, um, it, no one would ever say uniformity, but that was certainly the, the message that we received. And um, especially if you pushed against it a little bit, you certainly found out that that was the message. And so um, it's not about uniformity, it's about unity, but we have to be unified around Jesus Christ. And, and so Paul here is responding to these questions that they've asked about. And, and, he's, and, and so in this letter, he's responding to them, um, talking about the problems of Christians living in an immoral world. And we certainly live in an immoral world. Corinth was, uh, if you want to call it this, the gold standard of an immoral world to live in and a very difficult place for Christians to, uh, to live a godly life, not an impossible world at all, but a difficult world for them to live in, just as we find, you know, I, I look back on, yikes, how many years I've been a Christian now, but, uh, you know, and, and how things have changed, and the things that in not just the world, but among believers that we will accept today, that even 10 years ago, but especially 20, 30 years ago, we, we wouldn't have just blushed. We would have, we would have said, no way, turn that off. Don't even talk like that. Who are you to say something like that? But now it's like, well, you know, everybody's going to sort of think what they want and say what they want. And that's, those are Christians, let alone the world. And, and so I often wonder what it was like for the church in Corinth. And yet, and, and I know this has been said many times, but, uh, you know, Corinth was a, a, a city, a um, very large city, a couple hundred thousand people living there. And, uh, it, and because of the level of immorality and the effect that that had on the believers as they came in from the world, they came to Christ. Uh, here they were now getting drunk because they weren't using Welch's at the communion table. So they're getting drunk at the communion table. Some people were getting there first and drinking before the others. It was called a love feast. They weren't using chips of, of matzah or gluten-free uh, matzah, but uh, like we do. If you didn't know that, by the way, and you, and you have an issue uh, with gluten, remember, we use gluten-free matzah. But, uh, but they didn't use that. I mean, it was a feast. It was a love feast. And, and, and so he, he'll have to rebuke them when we get to chapter 11 in about six years. Um, and <laughs> at the rate you're going, John. Um, and, and they were just the idea of you know, how many wives a person, a man would have. I remember being at a pastor's conference um, in um, Steve Simpson invited me to three pastor's conferences in Nepal. And, and they're a blast. If you ever get a chance to do something like that, uh, do it. If you, if you, in fact, if you've never been on a short-term mission trip, do it. But, um, but, but I remember going, you know, going, going to this pastor's conference, and, and my job was, along with some of the other guys who went, was to, to teach these pastors and elders from all these different churches around Nepal. I mean, and they put us to shame. They really do. I mean, here are these, these guys who traveled maybe on foot for two days just to get to a trailhead and then to, you know, catch, if they could afford it, to catch a little jitney type of bus to another place and then walk further. I mean, they, they would travel, you know, three, four, five days to get to this pastor's conference uh, to hear what the white... Um, American pastors were going to say. And so each one of us taught on different topics. And, 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 and the way we would set it up, I, I really wanted to set it up in, in my classes that we would have, I think we had an hour and 15 minutes or something. So, you know, teach, you know, if you think of teaching for 45 minutes, you got to change that when you're using a translator. So, you know, teach for less that and it gets translated. And then we would open it up for Q&A. And um, I, after a while, you know, I, I used the same translator for uh, the, each of the three times that I was there, which is good because you know there's this rhythm that you have to establish when you're working with a translator. And um, and and Seth was my translator. Uh, so one time we were, we opened up to this Q and A, and we had been in I don't know one of the Timothys or something. So it had to do with church order and and that kind of thing. And one one elder raises his hand and and he starts asking this question in Nepali and. Um, and now all these other guys are like, you know, 
bum, 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 they're going back and forth with one another. And, and I'm thinking, like, well, what, what do I do, order out for pizza or something? Like, what? It's, it's a, just ask me the question, but put it in English. You know, what's going on? I said to Seth, what's happening here? What, what are they talking about? Well, this man is saying that there's a man in their fellowship who uh, has two wives, and he's a Christian now, and the, the, his second wife, I mean, he didn't divorce the first one, he has two wives, which is common in the culture. And so, um, but, but because the woman that he married um, is a believer, um, he feels like that's okay. So what, is that okay? Should he do it? Like, I'm supposed to answer this? Uh, like, well, which one is he supposed to get, get rid of? Um, uh, you know, they, and, and he, he, they think he should get rid of the, the non-believer. And so that was a very interesting time. Um, and, and, you know, we, we take a lot of things for granted in our culture, uh, all, even though it's so much of the, the, the things that we've held firm for so many years are sliding away. Um, Corinth was, was just rife with that. And, and so Paul is dealing with this matter of, of uh, celibacy, immorality, singleness, uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Uh, and even in saying that, I, I might divide the room by saying that. Certainly, you know, uh, 20 years ago that would have divided the room very quickly. Uh, things have changed in, in the church today. Uh, you're thinking, what are you waiting for? Why don't you just teach it? Well, I'm, what I'm doing here is saying, so there's a lot of things that, that, that play in here, and Paul's actually touching on a lot of topics. So um, I'm going to try to move through many of these things. Bottom line, this whole book is actually a very practical book because here is Corinth, which as, as full of immorality as it was, as much adultery as there was, as much drunkenness as there was, as much of all, everything that you can think of and you would actually never want to even mention as much as it existed, yet God had poured out his spirit mightily and thousands were saved. And, and yet here they were, a very carnal church. We touched on that last week, this idea of you know, there's two types of people. There's the, there's the natural man and the spiritual man. And then next, out of the spiritual man, there's the one who is carnal, though a Christian, and the one who is walking with the Lord. And that's, that's who he's speaking to. He's not speaking to non-believers. He's speaking to believers, some of whom are walking with the Lord and some of whom, many, many of whom, are carnal. They're, they're, they're in the flesh. And so it it therefore really does apply to us as, as, um, as a church living in Chalfont, living in America. Um, and so he says, concerning the things that, that you wrote about, he says, uh, he, he said, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. The idea is not, not doesn't mean touch, don't shake her hand. That's not what it means. It means don't, it means don't, touch her so that, it, it, actually the Greek really means don't touch her so that she begins to heat up. That really is what it means. And that runs both ways. That, that but men are not to touch women and women are not to touch men in such a way that it, that it gets our libido um, moving. And, and he says, it's, he says, I'm just telling you, that's, it's good for a man not to do that. Nevertheless, he says, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, that's one, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Uh, now to us on the surface, the, the response to that is, well, okay, that just makes sense. But that, that was... Um, that, that's, a, that's a stark statement in the first century in Corinth. And frankly, it's a stark statement in the first century in many places in the Roman, the, the Greco-Roman world. Uh, when you read uh, the Apostle John's epistles, um, he deals, and, and, you, and when you read uh, Colossians, uh, 
you come across an idea that's not mentioned, it doesn't use this word that I'm about to use, but it is the philosophy that was prevalent in that age. And that philosophy was Gnosticism, G-N, Gnos, but, but Gnosticism. It comes from a, a Greek word, Gnosko, which means to know. Or, um, and, and, and many Gnostics, I'll explain it briefly in a moment, but many Gnostics were uh, what they called epinostics, super Gnostics. They were into the super knowledge or the superior knowledge. That was the idea. What does that mean? Well, simply for, for our sakes, what it meant was they looked at the world, they looked at human beings as being made of, and it's true, isn't it? Flesh and spirit. And so since we're flesh and spirit, from their standpoint, it, it, we don't realize sometimes how much Greek philosophy really affected things in, in that day, or for that matter, how much it affects things today. And for that matter, even when we speak about the New Age movement, or when we speak about the things that are going on in the church, in, in certain parts of the church today, um, how much of that is actually, uh, you know, we, we have this label we call New Age, and a lot of times we think it, it, it comes out of the Far East, you know, and it does. But much of it is, is just this, <laughs> there is no such thing as New Age. The, you know, the teachings of the New Age come out of the Old Age, and it's a lie that comes from the garden. And so it's just always repackaged. It's just relabeled and repackaged different ways. And in that day, and it exists today in different ways, but in that day, the idea was, actually there were competing ideas within the same philosophy. One idea was, we are flesh and spirit. So since we are flesh and spirit, flesh is fallen. Flesh is bad. Flesh is sinful. When we speak of the flesh, we're speaking of the, the, the fleshly nature or the, or, or, or the sinful nature. And since we're speaking of the sinful nature and the sinful nature resides in the flesh, deny the flesh. You know, um, you know, don't feed the flesh. So sometimes it was don't feed the flesh, fast from everything, um, and which is, it's not bad to do those things. But, you know, but, but it was taken to an extreme. So fast from everything, fast from anything that would give pleasure to the, to, to the flesh. If you have to eat, sure, you have to eat to live, so eat just the very minimum and, and don't even eat stuff you like. You know, just, just enough to stay alive, Eat lima beans. Um, now, some of you may be thrilled with that. You know, it's like, have at it. Um, oh, I'm just, just the gag reflex just goes just thinking about it. But, 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 you know, just go ahead, eat the lima beans. They're fine. I mean, if you're going to put them in, in soup or a stew or, a, or, or something, that's fine. Hide them. But, but lima beans, especially, can I just say the canned lima beans? Renee loves them, you know, and I love her. But, but, but not the lima beans, especially canned lima beans. They're the worst. But, but go ahead and, and, and eat lima beans enough to stay alive. Feed the flesh in that way. But don't feed the flesh. Don't, you know, don't drink so as to get drunk. That would be evil. Don't, um, don't please yourself sexually. That nature is given to us by God. But, but don't do that. Don't feed that. Rather... Feed only the spirit. There's a division between flesh and spirit. So, see, that's the idea. There's a division. The other idea, it's, it's hard to believe they both come under the same umbrella called Gnosticism, but the, uh, and, which is kind of funny to me because, Gnosti again, it means knowledge. They're the know-it-alls. They're, they're the big know-it-alls. They know everything. And yet, when you start to think about what they think they know, it's kind of dumb. But, but the, the other way of looking at that, they, so there were divisions like Democrats and Republicans within the, within the Gnostic you know, following. The other way of looking at that was, no, there is flesh and there's spirit. They're divided. And flesh is, flesh is fallen. It's bad. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. Spirit is good. Flesh rots. After, after we die, flesh rots away, and, and the spirit lives forever. So do whatever you want to with your flesh. Do anything you want to. If you want to go and hang out with the temple prostitutes, be they, be they heterosexual or homosexual, have at it. Go get drunk, feed your flesh, do whatever you want, 
eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you're going to die, but your spirit's going to live forever. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins. These are Gnostic Christians, okay? So, so do what you want. See the, I mean, those are radically different ideas. And, and I've taken you down that road so that you understand some context here. And, and when we look at 1 Corinthians and some of the problems they were facing and how easily it was, or how easy it was for them to be confused about, um, about some of these issues. And, and hopefully, as you read, uh, particularly 1 John, or you read Colossians, and you start to understand more now um, what, what, you know, what he's saying there. Um, so Paul's prescription, basically, is that it's, it's good to be single, don't stop there, but he's, say, he's saying it's good to be single, but, but he's also saying it's natural to be married, and he's going to say that singleness is a gift. If you, know, if, if you, if you can be single, it's a gift to be single. It's not expected that we be married, but um, I'll just leave it there for a moment. So, so anyhow, so um, he says, verse 3, he says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. It's two-way street. Do not deprive, or the word is also defraud. It can be translated defraud. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. He's saying it, this is not a command. The Lord hasn't said, you know, this is, this is exactly what I have to say. He's speaking, in a sense you could say Paul's speaking as a pastor. He's speaking at, with a shepherd's heart having, you know, watched people. And, and I would also say, and I, I realize that there's, scholars are divided over this. We're probably divided over this. People have all kinds of opinions about the Apostle Paul and, and you know, who he, well, who he was in terms of, you know, whether he'd ever been married or things like that. But I, I'm going to tell you from the outset that as I read Paul's writings, he speaks as a man with experience in marriage. And even though he says some things, he'll say, even as I am, when he sp speaks of being single. But we have to be careful about the conclusions we draw. So he, so he says this. Now he goes on in, in verse 7. He says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself. See that? Single. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. And I, you could include spiritual gifts, but really in the context of what he's speaking of, remember, the context throughout all of this is marriage, and the context throughout all of this is marriage, um, believers' marriages, unequally yoked marriages, sexuality in marriage. See, this is why we have children's ministry. And, and you know, so uh, th that's the context throughout this. So when he speaks of gifts, sure, we can think spiritual gifts, but he's, he's going to include um, singleness as a gift. If you want to call it celibacy, you could call it that too. That's, that's, an, that's a reasonable exchange, but for our purposes, I'm going to call it singleness. And let me just finish it, these three verses here. He says, he says for, for, for I myself wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows. Now, the, the, the sense here is that he's speaking to Christian widows, women, whose husbands have died. We're not talking about divorce. That's, that's another issue that will come up later on. But, but to, to, to the unmarried and to the widows. So to the singled, to the singles, and to the widows. It's good for them if they remain even as I am. So two times in these couple verses, he uses that same phrase in two verses. 
even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now, now, if you have King James, and it just ends there. Better to marry than to burn. Um, it means, and that's why if it's italicized in your Bible, burn with passion. Um, in fact, he'll, he'll even say, is it First Timothy? Where he gives instructions about um, the church's responsibility toward the widows in the church. That, and, and he gives, I'm not going to go off on it now, we'll, we'll deal with it when we get there someday, but uh, um, uh, he gives a list of requirements before, before, you know, be, before you can determine whether or not the church actually has responsibility to take care of this woman who is a widow. She has to be over 60 years old. You think, boy, that was old in those days. It's not real young today, but, but certainly it was, it, was, it was old in those days. But, but his, he goes on, he, you know, this is a woman who had to be you know, over 60 years old. She has to have you know, washed the feet of the, the, feet, the, feet, uh, the, feet of the, of the saints um, and, and, and a number of other things. This is a woman who has to love the Lord Jesus and, and really serve. And his point is, lest she becomes, and he actually uses the word, it has sort of a different context in our day and age, lest she becomes wanton and now starts to move toward you know, other men. It's better for her, rather than the church to take care of her, it's better for her to be married, to be remarried at that point, he says. Um, now, some of you may be thinking all kinds of things. I didn't write this. See, I just, I report and you decide. But I, you know, but, but this is an important point here because he's, he's talking about even as I am. Well, what is he? Um, you know, if we you don't have to go there, but let me just read to you very quickly. A very familiar passage. You've heard it before, read it before. God bless you. Um, and all of you, just so we're all covered for tonight. Um, he says in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 4, um, let me just read it. He says, though, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, um, a righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And of course, he goes on from there to say, but what things were gained to me, I have counted loss for Christ. And he goes on and, and talks about how, um, and of those things which he he thinks are would have thought wonderful, not just loss. Um, the newer translations say refuse, but really dung is the, is the word he uses. He's, they stink. They're nothing. They don't, you wouldn't even begin to consider them in measuring up to who he is now in Jesus Christ. Well, the reason I went there from 1 Corinthians, because he says twice in those, in those two verses, verse 7 and verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 7, I wish that men were even as I am, I myself am. What does he mean? Well, he seems to be saying single, and I would stipulate that he is saying that. The question is, has he always been single? Paul the Apostle, uh, by, by all accounts, was a contemporary of Jesus Christ. But by contemporary, I mean he was probably born about the same time. So when, when Jesus was, was crucified at 33 and a half years old, we'll say, you know, just to kind of pick a marker in 32 AD, Paul was probably about the same age. So we read in, in uh, chapter 7 of Acts that when, um, uh, when Stephen is called before the, the august assembly, and they are, they, they're the ruling body of all Israel, the Sanhedrin, made up of two religious political parties in those days, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. And and they, they, call, they call Stephen to give account, and of course he does give account. He, he preaches and he, he nails them. And, and he says, you're just like your fathers, you do always. You're a, you're a stiff-necked generation, or I guess if you're down south, you're a stiff-necked generation. Um, you know, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. 
and, and, and we read there that they, they gnashed their teeth. They're so angry. They gnashed their teeth, and they pick up stones to, to stone them, and they did. But they laid their, their clothes down at the feet of a young man named Saul, the one who writes this letter. Now, we read, you know, Paul, he'll say in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in saying to the Corinthians, he says, don't we also meaning himself and the others who traveled with him. Do, do we not also have a right to, um, to travel with, with our believing wives and families, just like Peter and, and the other guys do? So Peter is also married. Um, that's a suggestion, if, if nothing else. At the very least, it's a suggestion that Paul was married. I think the, the real key is that Paul was a member of the Pharisees. Or, or, excuse me, a member of the Sanhedrin. And in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to first be 30 years old or older, and you also had to be married. It's something, something that we don't think about a lot. In, in those days, in, in the first century, uh, and, and even the first century before Christ, the, 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 the oral law, okay, or what becomes known as the Talmudic law, okay, added on to, you know, the, the law of Moses, but um, so it's it's extra biblical. But the but the rules were that if if you were over twenty years old, you're a man. You're over twenty years old, and you're not married. You're in sin. You're actually murdering your progeny because because you haven't found a wife in order to bring children into this world. And so here he's thirty years old. And he's a member of the Sanhedrin. You, number one, you had to be married in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin. Why? Because you'd be in sin if you weren't married. So I, I made my case. But he's, he's, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. But at this point, he's saying, you know, I wish that, you know, that all of you were even as I am, which is what? Single. Well, what happened to his wife is always the question that the people ask. And the, and the clear answer is, beats me. I have no idea. But he must have been married. Okay, maybe his wife died at some point. That could be. It could be that um, after he, you know, a after he came back from his time, on, you know, the road to Damascus and, and his journeys, and when he came back, his wife heard what he had to say and said, I'm out of here. That's crazy. I don't believe that. You know, I've stood with you through all this. You've been persecuting this sect of Judaism, and, and now you're one of them. That's one possibility, too. Or, you know... He said, honey, I'm, I'm taking off for a couple of weeks. I'm going to go kill some Christians. And, you know, along the way, he's, you know, the, he falls off of his horse and he's down on the ground and he, and he hears from the Lord. And then after being in Damascus and then and going out into uh, the wilderness for all those years, you know, five years later, he comes back. Can you imagine going out for a milk for five years? And, you know, you come back and she's not there. So we don't know, but, but uh, he's single now. In any case. And he said, so I, I wish that men were even as I am. He's single now, but he wasn't all the time. He was married. And so he speaks. The reason I, I'm taking all that time to say that is that many times we can listen to what the Apostle Paul says and think, well, what does he know? This is a man who doesn't seem to have a wife, so what would he know about being married? And men can think that. And very often I have found over the years that um, men may, may really identify with Paul in, in a lot of ways, or you know, just like some of the things that he says. How can you not like Paul? I mean, I mean he's a, the greatest, and he's probably the most intellectual of men that the world has ever seen. And, and, and you know, he's, he's, he's written so much of, of the New Testament. But very often, women don't seem to care. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a sweeping generalization, generalization, I realize. But very often, I find that, that women have some issues with Paul that they might want to take up with him at some point in the future. And, um, and it might have to do with 1 Timothy 2. It might have to do with a number of different things. And you know what? I think um, that as the more we study Paul the more, and learn more about who he is and his loving heart for the saints and how much he loves all the saints how much he loves women, I think that women start to change their mind. Now, I'm speaking way out in the generalization area. I, I know that. 
but um, he gets a bad rap, and it's a bad rap. He doesn't deserve it. But he says, now to the married, verse 10, we'll get there. To the married, he says, remember, the assumption is both partners are Christians. To the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. In other words, not my opinion. This is the Lord speaking. A wife is not to depart from her husband. The Bible says that, right? And that, that's God's standard from, you know, we see that from Genesis chapter 2. That's before the law, of course. But um, Genesis chapter 2, we find that throughout the scripture. A, a wife's not to depart from her husband or vice versa. And, Paul, and, and, and Jesus certainly makes that clear um, in the Gospels. The, I mean, the sort of the, 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 the keystone passage is Matthew 19. We might look at that in a little bit. But he says, a wife's not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried. Even if they do. Let's say they, they have a problem. They're both married, and they've got issues with one another, and, and, and they've said, I, I can't even stand to look at your face anymore. Not like that's ever happened to anybody. But I mean, you know, that... That they, 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 they just can't get along, he says, nevertheless, they're not to divorce, right? He says, uh, let her remain unmarried. Even if they did depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. It goes both ways. He's not saying one more than the other. It, it works both ways. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, he's saying, now this is more my pastoral opinion, you might say. I, not the Lord, in other words, this is not a command that's come from God. Every single thing that we think of in life, we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily find a chapter, verse, or a page in our Bible that says, this addresses you know, every single thing we come across. I, I, I'm not familiar with the chapter and the verse on internet pornography. But I could certainly take you through enough chapters and verses that deal with matters that pertain to that technology. See, the technology is not written about in the Bible, but the, the, but the topic of immorality, the topic of lust, all those things are here. So, you know, he's, he's using good, what I would call good scriptural sense. He's saying this is not a command from God. This is my observation. This is my counsel, you might say. This is what I would say to you. He says... He says, uh, to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Stop there for a second. The idea is they, they, they were married at one point. They, neither one of them were believers. And somewhere along the line... She got saved, or he got saved, and and the other the other partner can't stand it, can't stand it. I and and maybe some of you are experiencing that, you know. But but certainly we've seen that in here in the church over the years uh, enough, where um, you know the, the the one partner, the, the unbelieving partner, is like this: Jesus, 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 Jesus. Always, oh, she's you know she's talking Jesus to me, and 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 she starts to feel like, well, then I want nothing to do with him. You know, if 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 he doesn't if he doesn't appreciate my Jesus, then I want out of here. And Paul is saying, no, don't do that. And it runs the other way too. Don't don't leave. Why? He says something. That can be misunderstood, but he says, the, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified. Set apart is the idea. He doesn't say saved. He's not saying that if you're the unbelieving partner and your wife or your husband, who, the one who is the believer, is saved, then the unbeliever will be saved. He's not saying it's a guarantee. But there's, there's, there's something at work in that household. Well, God's at work, but in that household, God is at work. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. I mean, there's a lot that we could go into here, but he's, he, he's giving what appears to be a promise, or, or at least the, the promise that if, you, if you're faithful, 
you can see God do powerful things in your household. Don't cut and run. Don't cut and run. Just because your husband is not a believer or your wife is not a believer. Now, what he's not talking about is a purposely unequally yoked marriage. He'll say in you know, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And, and it comes out of Deuteronomy, the idea of, um, the idea of unequally yoking someone. We're not, to, we're not to marry someone. If we're a believer, we're not to marry a non-believer. It's, it's a sin. It's not a suggestion. It's a sin. And maybe some of you, I don't know everybody's situation, but I know in our church there are many marriages that are unequally yoked situations, and they started that way. You know, he says earlier, he says it's better to marry than to burn. He doesn't mean if, you know, because, because you don't have the gift of celibacy, um, you, you, you know, it's better to marry than to burn with lust. So go find, go find a woman or, or a man, depending on who we're talking about, you know, um, who can fog a mirror, who has a pulse. And, you know, the first one that you find, he's not saying go do that. And, and I've seen that. I've watched that over the years. I've, I've seen people say, I, oh, I met this girl. She's beautiful. Great. You know, it's great. That, that she's beautiful. Does she know the Lord? Well, you know, I mean, she, she, yeah, she goes to a church and she was raised, you know, does she know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, she believes in God and, you know, you start to get the, the step downs from there. And uh, maybe you've said that. I mean, I, I, I know lots of people who have. And it works the other way around too. I always like Spurgeon's illustration. Uh, I know I've said this before here, some of you heard me say it, but um, where a, a young woman came to him and said that, you know, she'd been in the Bible study, she'd been in the church for, for years, and she was, you know, in her young 20s or whatever she was, and she said, you know, I have, I have, met, I have met the man I want to marry. Does he know the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he's such a nice man. He's got a good job. He's only, but does he know the Lord Jesus Christ? No, but I know that, you know, he really appreciates you know, that, that, that I attend church and that I love Jesus, but does he know the Lord? And no, but I know that I'll have a great effect on his life. And so he, he pulled a chair out and he had her stand on the chair, which is probably a weird thing, telling some young woman to stand on a chair. And, um, and Spurgeon says to her, pick me up. I mean, he's all a 300 pounds. That was, Spurgeon was a pretty big guy. And, um, and she said, I can't pick you up. He said, well, just try and so she, she gave it the, you know, the old college try, and um, she couldn't do it. And then he picked her up, and he put her down on, on the floor, and he said, exactly, you'll never be able to bring him up to where you are, but he will always bring you down to where he is. Great illustration. You know, it says in, in, in Deuteronomy, and it's, a, and it's an agricultural community, right? So, and, and, and so God uses agricultural illustrations, and he says, you're not to yoke an ox with an ass. That's King James, okay? But you're not to, to yoke an ox to an ass. Why? Because when you put them in the, um, uh, when, you, when, 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 you, when you, what's the word I'm looking for? In the yoke. When you put them in the yoke, they're going to chafe against one another. And, and you know, one's going to pull harder than the other. And, and he says, you're not to do that. And, and Paul uses the same illustration you know, he says not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, so, you know, very often people will find themselves in a situation where you start to look at the guy and say, you know, he's just such a dumb ox. I mean, he's, yeah. well, what does that make you? Uh, you know, based on that, uh, that's, I'm just quoting the Bible here. So, uh, uh, there are consequences. There's no question that there are consequences. But nevertheless, Paul says, if you are living in a situation like that, just because your, your, um, your husband or your wife is, um, is not a believer, don't leave. It's not right to leave because there are things that God will do, and God will do. God will, God's going to work. Uh, we can, I, he, he, actually, I can't avoid it. I've got I to mention this because he says, Otherwise, he says, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. What does that mean? 
Well, you can do a lot of things with that, but certainly one thing right off the bat, our children, our children can see. They can, they can look. They can observe all of our children. It doesn't matter how young. It doesn't matter how old. But they know the parent who's saying the right things. They know the parent who's loving them. They know the parent who's, who's speaking to them about the Lord and about righteousness and what is right and what is wrong versus the one who doesn't care about those things. Children know those things. They can pick that up, and as time goes on, they'll, they'll certainly draw their conclusions. And they'll know that even if they, they aren't accepting the Lord earlier in life, they'll know that as they go through life. But the idea that, that children are saved, people have all, and th th there is so much fodder in this chapter to, to keep dividing the room. But, um, but the idea that there is some line of demarcation that only God knows. We call it um, the age of accountability. So we use that phrase. But you'll never find it in the scripture. You'll never find it called that, and you'll never find um, uh, an age. But there is that idea in scripture. And, and you, can, you can find a lot of places, you know, when... when um, when David sinned with, San, with Bathsheba and uh, the child, after the child was born, the child gets sick and um, David is fasting and praying and, and he's just, I mean, he's, he, he's just laid out on, on the ground. And then he can tell that, you know, the servants are, are speaking differently. He can hear them talking and he, he asks, is, has the child died? And they said, yeah, and he got up and he got cleaned up and dressed and combed his hair. And they said, you know, when you were, when, when you were before, you know, you were all broken, broken down, but now, you know, you're, you're fine. What's, what gives, Trent, you know, basically. And, and he said, while he was still alive, I thought, who knows, maybe God will heal. But now, there's nothing I can do about it. I... Uh, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. That's a really interesting passage. I will go to him. What does that mean? David had confidence that he would see his son one day. He knew where his son was. And, and, and you know, the, the idea, it's not just a tradition, it's, a, it's the biblical teaching. The uh, Sheol in Hebrew is the abode of the dead the abode of the righteous dead as well as the wicked dead, and the righteous were separated from the wicked by a great chasm. And uh, we read about that. The New Testament version of that concept is found in Luke 16. The idea, the Greek word Hades is almost, basically a replacement for that concept of Sheol. And, and Jesus talks about the rich man who's in this place of torment and the, and the beggar, who is in a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise, this, this place of delight in this area of Hades or Sheol. So in David's case, he knew that his son was in paradise, in Sheol. He wasn't, he wasn't in torment because of his sins. And David knew the Lord and he knew that he would see his son one day. Jonah and you know, if, you know, we can tell all the stories we want about Jonah and, and, and the fish and, and all that, but Jonah is the only book, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this one, it's the only book you're going to find in the Bible that's going to end last, that's going to end, the last sentence ends with a question mark. Where Jonah is so torqued because of God's mercy that he's shown to the Ninevites because of this great, this great awakening that happens in Nineveh. When, when Jonah goes through Nineveh, you know, we all know the story, he didn't want to go, right? And then, you know, the, the whole, you know, the ship and, and all the different issues that happened, the great storm, and he finally says, throw me in, and, and they, the sailors don't want to. These are pagans. And they, they finally, they ask the Lord for forgiveness for what they're about to do. The Lord, they don't even know the Lord. They, they ask forgiveness for what they're about to do, and they throw him in, and then a great fish, not a well, but a great fish comes and swallows him up. And for three days and three nights, Jonah is in this fish. Now, this is a high-speed fish because he made it to, you know, uh, f far enough, uh, you know, up to, 
um, the, uh, up the Euphrates to Nineveh where, so that he could get to Nineveh. And, and when he came out, you know, we, we think of Jonah now, repentant, and, and willing to go in and what we would say, preach the gospel. He didn't really preach the gospel. He just said, 40 days and you're crispy critters. You know, he was looking forward to them dying. He hated them. He didn't want to go there in the first place. And, and uh, you know, you wonder why we don't go sometimes. Read Jonah. And, and then when they did repent, I mean, they repented from the king on down to the lowest person. They even put sackcloth on their animals. And, and so uh, all these people repented of their sin, and God relented for over 100 years. The book of Jonah is about how God withheld his hand of judgment against Nineveh because they repented. The book of Nahum is about how God, 100 years later, brings judgment on Nineveh. But anyhow, Jonah is torqued. And, and God says to him, chapter 4, you have a right? Do you think you have a right to be angry? He says, I am angry. I do have a right. And, 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 and you know, he had been delighted because God had caused this gourd or this plant to grow up and protect him from, from the sun out in the desert, and now this, this plant had died, and he's angry about that. And do you have a right to be angry? I do. Do you have a right to be angry about this gourd? I do. And God says to him, you care about a, about a plant which grew up in a night and died in a night. Should I then not have compassion or mercy for this great city Nineveh with 120,000 who don't know their right hand from their left hand and also many cattle? Question mark. End of the book. It's like, did we miss something here? Did, is there a chapter we're missing? No, God leaves it there. And he leaves it there, I think, for us to be challenged with. Should I not have compassion? Do I not have a right to have compassion? This is who I am. I'm, that's my character as God. I have compassion for people. And he did, and he does. He still does. But who are the 120,000 who don't know their right hand from their left hand? Don't just call them Ninevites. They're children. They're the ones who don't know their right hand from their left hand. And you can go on. I, I think you, you, you can pick up the concept in, in Romans chapter 7. Paul said, uh, you know, I was innocent in light of the law until I became a man. Then I understood the law and I was guilty. Maybe what he's referring to is what we would call, um, you know, bar mitzvah. When he was, you know, in the Jewish culture, 13 years old, where, where a, a boy becomes a man in a sense and takes accountability before God. For, for knowing the law and, and how he's going to live. And that could be what he's referring to there. But in any event, as you walk through the scripture, you find that. And I suspect, and it's only my opinion, you do what you want. But, you know, everybody talks about the rapture, and, and, and which, which we're going to study on Sunday. But, but we talk about the rapture, and, and are we going to leave all our clothes behind, and all that stuff when we're raptured, and that's all fun to talk about. The real question is, who's going up? Of course, we think we're going up, and that's great. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, we are. Or you are. But what about all those Hindu kids, and what about all those Muslim kids, and, and, and what about all those pagan children throughout the world who have, not, who have not yet reached that line of demarcation, which no one can measure except God himself? I suspect they're going too. You know? Sometimes we think, oh, no, they've got to come from a Christian family. God has mercy on those who don't know their right hand from their left hand or don't know, you know, one from the other. Okay, I'll just keep moving. Anyhow, um, he says, but, verse 15, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. If you're a believer, if you're a woman or you're a, a man and you're a believer and your husband or your wife who's not a believer, who is not a believer, departs, said, a brother or sister is not under bondage. You're not bound to the covenant of marriage at that point. Is, is no longer under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. 
you know, without going into a whole long study, because we certainly don't have time, but, but when we read about this in, in, um, in the Gospels, and the Pharisees come to, to Jesus, and they ask him, is it, you know, is it right for a man to divorce his wife? And, and I think a lot of us in this room are familiar enough. There were, there were different schools of opinion. The school of Shammai was, um, uh, was a very conservative school. They interpreted the law a certain way. The school of Hillel was, was more liberal, and they, they, they applied the law in a more liberal way. But in that day and age, um, a man was allowed to divorce his wife with a simple decree. Um, and it's even held in some places in the world today. Uh, in Islam and, and uh, not in, in uh, what we call civilized Judaism, but, you know, but in, in certain places in the world, the idea that a, a man could say to his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Three times it's done. And, and, and Hillel said it was okay. He could do that. Even if she, if she talked ill about his, his, uh, his mother or father, like that, that never happens in a marriage, but you know, if you know, if if, if she did that, um, uh, or, or if we say burn the gravy, or all kinds of things. Um, whereas school of Shammai said no, it had to be something more like what we would talk about today. It had to be you know adultery. It had to be you know some sort of sexual immorality that occurred. What Paul is saying here, if the non-believer, if after. You've been married, and, and one comes to Christ, and the other can't stand it anymore. Can't stand all this Jesus stuff. That doesn't mean you're allowed to torture him. Okay? Like, it doesn't mean you go to 12 Bible studies a week, and so the guy says, I never see my wife anymore. You know? No, that's a, you're not allowed to drive him away. Uh, but but if, if, he, if he says, I can't take this Jesus stuff in my wife, or vice versa, I can't take this Jesus stuff in my husband, and chooses to leave, Paul is saying, let, let them depart. You're not bound at that point. God has called us to peace. I would, I would just say, you can extrapolate that biblically, because the idea here is exceptions. We're not to divorce. You know, we read in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, that God hates divorce, and God does hate divorce. And God hates murder. And God hates us taking the name of the Lord in vain. And God hates sexual immorality. And God, I mean, we can go down the list of all these things that God hates. God hates divorce. But there are times when people break that covenant. And, and Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 19 when speaking to the Pharisees that God, that, that Moses gave this law not to force it to happen, but for the hardness of your hearts, but because people cause these things to happen. And hardness works both ways. Sometimes out of hardness of heart, people continue to sin against the other. And sometimes the hardness builds in, in the victim, you know, who's constantly being sinned against. He constantly goes out on me, or whatever the case may be. He gave it for the hardness of, of your hearts, Jesus said. And I would suggest to you that when, when Paul says, if, if the unbeliever chooses to depart, let him depart. Brother or sister is not bound in such cases. That suggests then, I think you can conclude, that falls into the same exception category that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 19. That if that brother or sister now, the believer, is not bound, that means they're no longer bound to that marriage covenant and are permitted to remarry. However, I'll tell you our practice here Our pastoral practice is that we don't rush into anything. And if someone says, you know, he was a so-and-so, and he did this, or she was a such-and-such, and she did that, and, and they're gone now, but I found this guy, or I found this woman, and I want to marry, it's like, easy. Let's hold up here. There's a, there's a covenant of marriage that you've been under and, and, and you've been damaged by it. You've probably contributed to some issues. I mean, these things work both ways. Let's take some time. Let's counsel. Let's talk about some of these things and let's see if it's really the Lord or is it Lord or libido? Maybe that's a great, that's a great title for a sermon. Um, 
but, but that's our philosophy. We don't want to see anybody rush into it because the faster you rush into it, the, the greater your chances are for failure in the next relationship. Boy, I love this passage. Anyhow, um, <laughs> for how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know a husband whether you'll save your wife? In other words, don't rush these things. Don't rush to, to get out of it. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called to each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Um, yeah, look, I, I... We don't have a lot of time to get into that. Um, it, it's, but yeah, they, believe it or not, and you can look it up for yourself, Josephus talks about it and others, that they had a practice... Um, for that, but I, I, I don't even think that I'm ever going to explain it to you. Um, but if you're really interested, you can find out. The, the, the idea here, remember the context is still marriage. So he's saying in whatever condition you were in, whatever circumstance you were in when you were called to know Jesus Christ, stay there. You know, you, you're, you're not called to cease being a Jew. You're not called, which is very important, by the way, for every Gentile who comes into Jesus Christ to remember that when you share Jesus Christ with a Jewish person You're not calling them to not be a Jew anymore. They're still a Jewish person It's a matter of introducing them to their Messiah Okay, but in any event uh, He's saying or we would call it bloom where you're planted Stay in that situation. He said are you circumcised? Don't see, don't try to become uncircumcised. Are you uncircumcised? Don't don't seek to be circumcised You don't need if you, you know, especially in that day and age you're you're born in a Greek world and boys were not circumcised in most cases and um, Don't don't feel like you got to be circumcised in order to please, you know, the Jews who are around um, you know, and he, he talks about you know if um he said circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God, that's what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Well, then don't be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, then rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free, he is Christ's slaves. Key point, and this is where he ended chapter six. For you were bought at a price, do not become slaves of men. And I know I've said this many times, and I, uh, I said it in the second service on Sunday, but if you've ever tried to sell a car, you may think it's just a wonderful car, and, and, and you need to get 10 grand for it. But if you can't get 10 grand or nine or eight or seven, and someone's finally willing to give you $800 for it, what's the car worth? It's not worth 10 grand. It's worth whatever the market will give you. And it, it, it's worth what someone will pay for it. And that's the way it works with your house, no matter how much you love your house or anything else. But I paid this. Yeah, but the market is this, so that's what it's worth. What are you worth? You were bought the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. And what is the value of the blood of Jesus Christ? You'll never be able to measure it because, you know, we, we talk so much about creation, and I, I love talking about creation. I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous topic. Could God do it again? Quicker than, than you could, than you snap your fingers. What did it cost them? Nothing. He's spoken into existence. But as you start to walk through the scripture, you start to realize that everything in the scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the entire book is on one topic. And that topic is redemption. And the redemption is always by blood. And the Old Testament, it was looking forward to the cross. From where we stand today, we look backward at the cross of Jesus Christ. And on that cross, that cross is stained with the, 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 the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Blood that is of immeasurable value because it cost the Father everything to offer up his son for you. What does that mean? You are of immeasurable value to him. He loves you. He loves you so much that he would send his son to die for you. And it's hard to believe, but he also 
sent his son to die for those people we don't like, those people we hate, maybe. But he loves them just as much. And he's committed to us the ministry of what's called reconciliation. In other words, to share that message of reconciliation, that each one can be reconciled to the Father by the Son, Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that, is paid, that was shed to cover, to atone for, to kafar in Hebrew, to, to cover over permanently, to pay for my sins, your sins, so that when God looks at you and he looks at me, he sees us as white as snow. We read in Hebrews that, 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 that Jesus ever lives to intercede for us. He does. He intercedes. And, and so often we've thought he intercedes, you know, he's our advocate. John, the Apostle John says he's, he, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ. An advocate, of course, we think of advocate in terms of a lawyer, you know, someone who makes, makes our case before the judge. And that's, that's a great picture. But he doesn't intercede for us before the Father with words. He doesn't say, Father, I, I know John sinned again, but you know, he really, he really means well, and, and, and I paid the price for him. He doesn't do that. He intercedes with the wounds that I put in his hands and in his feet and in his side. He intercedes by the blood that he shed for me and for you. And so when Paul says here, and this is where we're going to end, because we're going to talk about a different topic on chapter 7 next week. In all of this, understand, you were bought at a price. You're no longer your own. None of us are. Unless you have rejected Jesus. If you continue to say, no, I am. I'm my own man. Well, then I guess you're not his. But if, and we're all in process. I know that. I, I get that. But we're no longer our own. We've been bought with the price. And the price is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he says, don't become slaves of men, but let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. And let God do that work in our lives, that he would continue to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to finish this up and I think it's important for each one of us next week as we come to this. Read it, please. But we're going to look at this in a different way, well, a little bit of a different way, and look at this whole matter of, well, what is singleness, really? And, and I think as we, as we look at it, we'll find that if we're, if we're open with what the Spirit has to say to us, it's pretty convicting to realize how much we can so often devalue those even in our own body, who are single. And how much Jesus loves them and, and what God is doing with them. How many single people there are in the Bible that we revere, we hold them up as, as men and women, great men and women of the faith, and they were single. God used them single, not married with, and producing children, but single. And, and that God has a great role. And, and you may say, well, I'm married, so it doesn't apply to me. It applies just as much to us as it does to someone who is single. Because so often we, we can look at a person who's single and say, well, it's normal to be married. So if you're single, you're... <laughs> We've got to be careful about that. We've got to be careful about that. God loves them. They're precious in his sight, just as much as we're precious in his sight. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your love and for, and for your word. Thank you for the things that you show us. Um, and yeah, it, we can stumble through some of this, I realize. But um, thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you would send your son to give everything for us. Lord Jesus, one day, uh, what an amazing concept, Lord. What an amazing thought to try and to, to picture it in our minds that one day we will bow before you and cast our crowns before you, Lord. And, and in your presence to give you the honor and the glory, but in our lives now, Lord, we, wanted, we want to do that, Lord. So be honored in our lives and by our lives and by this church and, and the things that we choose to do here, Lord, as we love one another
as you have loved us, Lord, as we forgive one another as you have forgiven us, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our lives and do the work you desire to do with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.